Thank you very much. And many thanks for inviting me to Oslo. I very much enjoy the time here. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. So I'm a mathematician, a trained mathematician, and uh, studied pure mathematics at the University of Bonn. Then did my postdoc still in mathematics and combinatorics in Japan. And then after coming back, I started with music information retrieval. So at a rather late stage of my career. And being a mathematician, I'm really interested in concepts, in algorithms, efficiency issues. So what I present today is really something from a computer science mathematics perspective. But I love to collaborate with people who like also music. It's a beautiful domain. Then afterwards, I went to the Max Planck Institute in Saarbrücken. I was there in a computer graphics lab, actually, studying, as you know, motion capture data also, which is also simply a time series in some respect. And since five years, I'm professor for semantic audio processing at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg. I have a small group of roughly five PhD students, and what I present today is, of course, not my own work. It's the work of an entire team. Uh, two years ago, I wrote up my, uh, so to say my, expe my experience on music information retrieval. Uh, so uh, I wrote a textbook, which took me two years of my life. Very, uh, yeah, painful. Uh, the result, I, I will pass around, so you may have a look at this. Okay, thanks. Uh, I'm now working at the International Audio Laboratories Erlangen which may be thought as a kind of a virtual institute. It's not a real institute. It partly belongs to the Fraunhofer Institute there and partly to the university. And I'm on the university side. It was founded using MP3 license money. MP3 was, so to say, developed and, uh, in Erlangen. So that's, so to say, the birthplace of MP3. At that time, it was not at all clear that MP3 would become a success. But then, maybe after five, ten years, it became the quasi standard and then generated quite a bit of money. And the audio labs are a kind of reinvestment of this money. On the university side, they have founded six professorships. And all these professorships, they are somehow dealing with the topic audio in a wider sense. So we have a professor for audio coding, psychoacoustics is an important topic, of course, spatial audio, multi-channel audio, audio, and finally also music. So I have the professorship for music processing, so to say. Now being at an electrical engineering department, that's where I am, it's always nice to surprise your students in the lecture by starting with music. So having studied in Bonn, of course, I need to take always Beethoven. <laughs> Music is really challenging and beautiful. And it's also challenging from a computer science perspective because you can represent music in so many different ways. It's not only about sheet music and visual representations, image data. You also have the acoustic data, waveforms, recordings. You can symbolically encode music, for example, using formats such as music XML. You have MIDI files for synthesizers, music literature, music films and film music. There's the relation to speech, singing voice, and of course also to motion when you think of dance. So many different representations all belonging to the same domain. That's beautiful, that's so to say, I always say, heaven on earth for computer scientists also. And also music being so rich links to so many different disciplines. Myself, I come from the signal processing side, so that's engineering. Then of course we use techniques from machine learning, that's hardcore computer science. It links to information retrieval, library science, human-computer interaction, of course musicology and so on and so forth. I want to start with a representation of music which is already pretty old, maybe 100, 120 years old. It's a piano roll. 
So that's a piano roll with perforated holes on it, stripes. And each stripe corresponds to a musical event, for example, to a note. Can be also pedaling information or dynamics somehow encoded. And these piano rolls were used more than 100 years ago to, yeah, to, to be used in, in player pianos yeah, using uh, pneumatic devices, air pressure. Schematically, a piano roll can be thought as a pattern of rectangles, two-dimensional uh, pattern. So time runs horizontally, pitch runs vertically. And each rectangle here in this visualization corresponds to a note. So the note duration is indicated by the left, let's say, less left lower corner of the rectangle, and the duration of a note is encoded by the length of the rectangle. Let's listen to a synthesized version of this rectangular pattern. If you know that this is a Fugue by Bach, a C major Fugue, it's easy to find this piece in the collection if you have metadata available. Now let's suppose you don't know the metadata, but you know the theme. Then using, for example, a rectangular pattern of this theme as a query, it can also be obtained by humming, for example. So let's suppose that's our query. One goal of computer science or of information retrieval is to find documents and also the portions in the document that are related to this query. So using this uh, rectangular pattern as a document, how many matches would you expect for those who were not in the tutorial yesterday? Any suggestions? How many matches should the system retrieve from this document using the, rec the red rectangle, red rectangles as a query? Yes, four. Okay, why four? I recognize four balance. Okay, visually. Yeah. Okay. So this is what you expected? Yeah. Okay, good. Four. That's not surprising. I mean, that's a four-voice fugue, so the theme is repeated four times. Maybe we listen again to this quickly. So, soprano, eh, alto. Now the soprano. Another half a match, right? Okay. Anyway, four matches, as you said, is what you expect. But, I mean, there are some variations. I mean, four exact matches, more or less, up to time shifts and pitch shifts. So, up to some modulations also. So, that's an easy task for a computer. Given a pattern, find similar patterns, especially if the notion of similarity is close to being the identity, so to say. Now, when you think of this piece being performed, yeah, then you may have some variations, temporal deformations, maybe rubato. You may have additional notes, ornamental notes, maybe some errors, playing errors, and so, off, and so on and so forth. Then the notion of similarity is already a bit vaguer. It's becoming harder for a computer to decide if this is a match or not. When you only have gestures, uh, the notion of similarity becomes even vaguer. What is still being considered as similar? Now this is still on the symbolic side of music. So the rectangles are given explicitly. So you can use techniques from text retrieval to solve this problem. Now when your data is given in form of audio data, all you have are oscillations, air pressure oscillations, waveforms. 
So the notes are not given explicitly any longer. So it's already much harder and much vaguer. In this scenario, for example, a content-based retrieval task could be to specify a query by means of a short audio clip. What should the system retrieve from a data collection? For example, from your audio collection at this library. What would you expect as a match having this as a query? I mean, at least it should retrieve the specific recording where the query is taken from. So, for example, in this case, it would be the Bernstein 1962 recording of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. Such techniques are well known and there are commercial products that can do that. For example, Shazam is such a system that allows you to do fingerprinting, audio fingerprinting, to retrieve exactly the audio recording the query was taken from. Now, as for classical music, maybe that's not enough. Maybe you also would like to have all the other interpretations of the same piece. This leads to a retrieval task we often refer to as cover song retrieval for pop music or version retrieval in classical music. So you also would like to have a Karajan version or maybe even the piano transcript from Franz Liszt played by Glenn Gould. Now, you may also be interested in finding all pieces that are somehow similar in terms of genre or motifs. So you also may retrieve, want to retrieve maybe a, another symphony by Beethoven. This leads to retrieval task we refer to as a genre classification and so on and so forth. So, there are many retrieval tasks that require completely different techniques depending on the notion of similarity you want to consider. In the following, I want to introduce a similar task related to uh, retrieval, which we call music synchronization. It's somehow related. You are given two versions of the same piece. So let's say, for example, an orchestral version conducted by Karajan and the piano version played by Shabakov in this case. And we are given only the waveforms. Then the goal of music synchronization is to automatically link or align these two versions, meaning to assign physical time positions in one version to musically corresponding time positions in the other version. And of course, because they play in different tempi and they, they, uh, yeah, they shape the music in different ways, that's not just a linear scaling. It's more complicated. What is this useful for? I hope that I do not have to convince people from uh, libraries that such a linking structure may be useful. For example, in the following scenario. Let's say you are interested in comparing different performances of the same piece. Then such a system may allow you to retrieve all recordings of Beethoven's fifth. In this case, these are four versions. And then playback for example, one of the versions, let's say the Bernstein version. And during playback, you can then seamlessly switch to any other version. For example, from the Bernstein to the Shabakov. So that's a nice way to compare these versions without tedious rewinding or so. Going back and forth. You can also see that similar passages in the recordings are encoded by the same color. Yeah, the first theme by blue, then we have a transition maybe in red, or a second theme. It's a mini version. Not so nice. So using these structures and the linking allows you to navigate within this data collection in a very convenient way. Okay. Of course,
course the computer science part is mainly to compute these alignments, these structures fully automatically. Okay, so that's a music processing challenge. In another scenario, one version may be an image file, a scanned image of sheet music of a piece of music and the other version may be an auto recording. And then the task is quite similar. In this case, we want to automatically align pixel positions in the scans to physical time positions in the audio. How can this be done? Or in other words, how can these two types of data be made comparable? That's how signal processing and uh, engineering comes into the game. So as for the image part, as for the sheet music, you need image processing techniques, for example, optical music recognition, to convert the pixel information into some kind of symbolic music format, which can then be represented by some kind of piano roll-like representation, as indicated by the first figure. Here, light colors encode the presence of a node event, and blue colors mean no event. In, in this. So that's a time pitch representation, so to say. On the audio side, you need signal processing techniques, like the Fourier transform or filter banks, to convert the waveform also into time frequency representations that can then be further processed to also derive some kind of piano roll-like representation. And on that level, on this mid-level representation level, you can already see that these patterns share certain structures. Yeah? And, and then you can use standard alignment techniques from text retrieval also, also, or techniques that are also used to compare, for example, DNA sequences in, 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 in bioinformatics to compute the alignment. And similar to the first scenario, you can use these now cross-modal alignments in an interface that allows you to uh, play back an audio file while synchronously visualizing corresponding meshes on the sheet music side. That's a kind of straightforward score following application and there are already commercial products out there. And then clicking on a measure on the sheet music, you can jump to the audio portion For a musician, for a musicologist, that may be a meaningful, a useful tool. You can do more with this tool. You can do also cross-modal retrieval by marking certain meshes in the sheet music. And then the system retrieves all audio recordings where these meshes are played. Marking the first theme of this rondo, of this rondo the theme appears in this example four times. So that are the four rectangles and each slide corresponds to a different performance. What you hear now is actually a Hammer piano version of that piece. So you can already guess that the system has to cope with many different kind of vari variations on the music side, on the representation side, on the performance side, on the acoustic side and uh, designing robust systems that, al that allow you to cope with all these variations is a very challenging task, also from a computer science perspective. Maybe that's a good point to maybe have some thoughts on, some general thoughts on music processing. Because in my experience, uh, this also often generates some misunderstandings of what we are doing and what we may be capable of and what not. I want to distinguish between two types of problems. One type of problem that is on a rather coarse level and one type of problem that is on a fine level. On the coarse level, you may be interested in finding out what different versions, different objects that relate to the same semantic thing may share. On the fine level, you may be interested in particularly finding out the characteristics of a specific version. On the course level, you may ask questions like, what makes up 
a piece of music, what makes up Beethoven's fifth. Whereas on the fine level you may ask questions on what makes music come alive. What is the difference between the Karajan version and the MIDI synthesized version? On the course level, you want to identify object, objects despite of differences, whereas on the fine level, you want to exactly identify the differences. On the course level, you, we have music information retrieval tasks such as audio matching, or yeah, audio retrieval, or cover song identification. On the fine level, maybe problems like tempo estimation, performance analysis. What makes Horowitz Horowitz, for example? So these two problems, these two type of pro types of problems are somehow complementary, often orthogonal. What you want to capture in one case is exactly what you want to, to be robust uh, uh, on in the other case. Typically, the course level tasks are easier to handle. Still, as computer scientists, we even struggle still on the course level tasks. The fine level tasks are often, yeah, future work. <laughs> not yet, uh, not yet uh, doable by a computer very often, only in rare cases. I mean, Gerhard Wittmer, for example, he is a specialist uh, in music information retrieval, uh, one of the leading scientists in that field. He's doing performance analysis and uh, he, he studied something like the Horowitz factor of music. So he wanted to find out what, why is the human so capable of identifying, oh, that must be a Horowitz, even though he may not know the specific performance just by the playing style. And then they tried to build intelligent systems 10 years ago and their conclusion was they, their systems were just above chance, just, a, just above guessing. Now with deep learning, Maybe we can do better. Let's see what, what will happen in the next years. Okay, so let me continue after having discussed the first course level task, music synchronization. Let us discuss a fine level task, tempo estimation, for example. Now, estimating the tempo directly from the audio is extremely challenging. However, if you have prior knowledge, and this is what we often have as humans, the task may become feasible to a certain extent. For example, in classical music, you often have also sheet music representation. I mean, that's also what we often have in our mind. We know the piece of music somehow on some level. Now, having a sheet music rep representation, you can use this as a reference. And then to get the tempo, what you can do is you can synchronize the reference, the score representation, being thought as a kind of neutral interpretation with the constant tempo, with the performance, with the audio, using synchronization techniques. And then from the alignment structure, you can derive the absolute tempo of the given performance. This leads to a measure tempo curve, a tempo curve. So time runs uh, horizontally, now the time is given in meshes and on the vertical axis you see the respective tempo applied by that pianist in the case. Let's listen to the Träumerei. Of course, being romantic music, there's lots of rubato going on. You would never guess that the tempo oscillates between 100 BPM to 140 BPM locally. It's still, I mean, you know, it's rubato, it's smooth, but if you would try to tap along, it's a disaster. And then you can, of course, compute tempo curves for other performances. So besides the blue performer, we also have a green and a red performer. And you can see the tempo curves are quite different. I mean, the red performance is the slowest one. It's obvious. But even though being different, they also share certain structures. So they tend to go up and down at the same measures. Of course, that's not a coincidence. I mean, there are musical reasons. For example, here in the second measure, you may argue that this piece is in F major. And so here in the second measure, you have some B flat major, so the subdominant somehow. So there's 
the pianists tend to slow down towards this climax and then again take up the tempo. Let's again quickly listen to that. Okay, so that's where we have some small retardando and then they take up again the speed. Okay. And of course, finding out such musical reasons is easy for a human, but extremely hard for a machine. So an, uh, an intelligent system should be able to say, oh, you know, there is a specific harmonic relation and that's maybe a kind of rule why pianists tend to slow down for this kind of genre. That's what we would like to do with a computer to some extent. It's extremely difficult. Not only the task is so ill-defined and difficult, but also because we often have to deal with measurement errors. I mean, when we compute these tempo curves, we rely on alignment techniques. But maybe the alignment techniques may fail because of acoustic reasons or algorithmic reasons. So for example, here you see a tempo outlier. I don't think that the pianist suddenly plays 180 BPM for a quarter of a measure. It's just a measurement error which is intermingled into the musically interesting variations. So that's another challenge we have. But maybe computer science may help to get the tedious stuff done. Maybe to do the beat tracking to a certain extent and then maybe you need another human round to correct smaller errors or outliers. And the task becomes even harder when there are no references available, when you only have the audio. For me, it was really impossible to <laughs> tap along the fiddle music I heard this morning without any prior knowledge or without having any reference in some way. And this is maybe a good point to again think of general, some general problems or we have to face in music processing. Again, I want to distinguish between two types of problems. In this case, not coarse and fine level, but relative and absolute case. Or in the relative case, the system is typically given a couple of versions. It can be different performances of the same piece, or it can be in the image domain, different uh, uh, photos from different perspectives of the same object, the same whatever building or so. In the absolute case, you only have one version, one performance, one auto recording, one image. In the relative case, you want to compare extracted parameters, whereas in the absolute case, you want to directly interpret the extracted parameters. In the relative case, extraction errors may often not have a consequence on the final result, whereas in the absolute case, each extraction errors, error becomes immediately evident. So example task in the first case is, for example, music synchronization. You have two versions, you only want, you only want to compare them. So maybe your mid-level features, your feature representations may be lousy. But maybe they are still good enough, I mean, to relatively compare two versions with each other and extraction errors may not even pop up, so to say. Whereas when you do music transcription, so when you want to convert the audio into a node level representation, every extraction error typically becomes a disaster. So absolute problems are usually much, much harder than relative problems. And that's what I was also uh, discussing with, with you yesterday. In the relative case, don't overshoot. Don't use techniques that are often used for the absolute case and then the features are only used for relative comparison. Then typically, yeah, you first try to solve a harder problem to solve a much easier problem. Uh, absolute problem like music transcriptions are, I would say, not yet solved with computers. There are some specific subgenres or scenarios where we get some reasonable results. For example, query by humming when you have a single monophonic voice then uh, maybe autocorrelation based methods or so may help you to extract the fundamental frequency and then having some kind of additional knowledge you can quantize it to notes or MIDI representation. With fiddle music it already becomes much harder, it's already polyphonic. 
with an orchestral piece, a symphony, uh, it's hopeless to think that you can extract node parameters without, with, without any additional knowledge. Still, that's what we want to do, what we would love to do. If this is a meaningful task, that's another question. I mean, <laughs> that's another problem we have as computer scientists. We often try to solve something which is completely meaningless, but, <laughs> but which is challenging. Uh, anyway, uh, let me quickly sketch uh, why beat tracking and tempo estimation as an example of an absolute task is challenging. I used the same example as yesterday, so for those who have listened to it, don't give the answer in a second, okay? So usually many people say, beat tracking, pff, easy. Everyone can tap along music and that's a soft task. So when you listen to a piece of music, and we try to do this with a computer. Should not be difficult, right? Now I should have taken the fiddle example from this morning. Uh, I have brought another example and, oh, not yet. Not yet, in a second. So first of all, in beat tracking, or let's say more generally pulse tracking, often it's not clear about the pulse level you are talking about, you are interested in. So when you think of happy birthday, the pulse level may refer to the measure level. So happy birthday to you. You also may clap along the so-called tactus, quarter note, or beat level. Happy birthday. You. But probably that's not a good level to tap along to understand the music. So uh, when you play piano as a kid, you may think on, on the beat level, but then your piano teacher, a good piano teacher would say, no, no, please think on a measure or phrase level. Yeah, otherwise you don't make music. That's not music. Then of course there are finer levels like the tatum level or temporal atom level. That's the perceptually the relevant finest pulse level occurring in a piece of music. In this case, it's the, uh, uh, the eighth note level. Happy birthday to you. And often it's not really clear uh, which level you should consider. As an example, let's consider some romantic music. And I now need a piano player from the audience who was not in the tutorial yesterday any piano player. Otherwise, I ask people working in the music library. <laughs> you want to serve a skinny pig? <laughs> or maybe a second uh, volunteer? <laughs> okay. I will play a piece of music and the task is to, to do beat tracking, to clap along on the beat level. Is this a well-defined task? It's pretty clear what I mean, right? Ah, you are nodding. Ah, you were, you were there yesterday? No. no. Okay, very good. So we have two, two, <laughs> two algorithms, okay? So, but I'm fair. I, I train you a bit. So I let you listen to the piece once, to the recording, and then the second time you have to loudly clap along the beat, okay? <laughs> so you are my computer. You can also do it jointly if you want, okay? or anyone else. Listen once. Beat level. Right. Beat level. Okay, so we are doing machine learning. That was the training phase. And now comes the test phase. Okay, you are ready? Maybe. <laughs> Anyone else also please help us.
So the end was pretty good, right? In the middle part, I mean, uh, now I, I, I evaluate you. I mean, that's what we also do in computer science. You have an algorithm, you let it run, and then you evaluate it using nice quantitative measures called precision recall and F measure. So uh, in the middle part, you did not clap along the beat level, I'm sorry. So you missed half of the beats, roughly. This is a really poor recall, as we say. Precision was okay. This gives an F measure of 0 0.5 in the middle part. The beginning was terrible. The end was okay. So altogether, maybe 0 0.5, 50% correctness. As computer scientists, we would say algorithm, no. Uh, state of the art is 70 5.8% and uh, so, no, you cannot publish, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, now, so what, what, what happened? Let's play back along again with the piece. So, first of all, we have Uvato. Here's a beat without an onset, and that's the beat level. You put no without prior knowledge. Okay, so there's a sudden change in tempo, and then you have the old tempo again. Okay, now with the fiddle music it was very similar. I could not even recognize the onset somehow, because I'm not, I was not really used to the music, and for me it seemed to be always somehow off, or I mean, I mean compared to the dances, without any prior knowledge. It's, it's really tough. Uh, and then, of course, as I said before, doing beat tracking for this kind of music is meaningless. I mean, nobody would tap along a romantic piece of music on the quarter note level, would you? I mean, okay. So, beat tracking is not a soft task. I don't have to tell you uh, as uh, people from musicology. Often it's not clear which temporal level to consider. Then there are local tempo deviations uh, all the time, Rita Dandi and so on, then often, and that's a major problem, uh, we often only consider node onsets for beat tracking. But, I mean, the beat is much more than node onsets. Often beats go along with, for example, chord changes or maybe other phrase endings and so on. And often in computer science, we only consider node onsets. That's not sufficient information. It's sparse. And then, of course, we do the beat tracking on the basis of waveforms. So we need to extract suitable, meaningful features from the waveform, and this leads to very often poor, corrupted features. So the beat tracking procedure has to be robust to such errors. Okay, so let, let us think a bit more about why music processing is challenging in general. Again, I want to take an example from a classical music area. So that's, I'm a hobby piano player. That's the reason I, all my examples come from this area. So that's a mazurka by Chopin. It's nice and supported by the left hand, it's an, yeah, so you would never look at the melody line for beat tracking in this case. Okay. Now, what we are dealing with as engineers, we are dealing with the waveform. So that's the same piece of music. That's the information we have. It does not look so nice. Of course, you can say they are transformed, like the short-time Fourier transform that allows you to convert the waveform into a time frequency representation. We have seen this uh, already in your presentation an hour before. And yes, there are some piano roll-like structures, but this really looks lousy and noisy. The note events, yeah, you may guess that they are somehow inside there, but then you have overtones, you have transients coming from uh, yeah, uh, keystrokes and so on. You have acoustics, uh, acoustic resonance effects, reverberation, uh, then uh, a disaster for engineers is the sustain pedal. Everything is, uh, is mixed up and uh, uh, then, of course, it's not sheet music, it's performance. You have deviations from sheet music. I've heard that even trained pianists uh, for certain types of music have uh, 
an error rate, whatever that means, of, I mean, three to five percent sometimes. But, I mean, they make errors which are not perceptually relevant. I mean, when you play Chopin and, and Etude and, and it's lots of pedaling, you, you get the right harmonies and the right voicing. You may miss one or the other note, but it's no problem. Dynamics uh, and intentional deviations, uh, trace notes, and so on and so forth. So it's a mess. And that was only piano. Okay. And then, of course, the music itself also is extremely, can be extremely complex. Let's come back to the final part of the Sematsuka. So when playing the piece myself, I was so busy with the fingering and, and that I was not really aware what was going on with that piece. I mean, of course, you have the melody line in the right hand and the, and the, and the accompaniment in the left hand, but then you have an additional voice somehow slipping in. And this voice is then played by left and right hand, so to say, somehow shared. And Do you understand what's going on? by listening to the music or looking at the sheet music. So you, that's the main voice and the accompaniment and then at least you heard there's some additional voice somehow in the middle. That's something which is okay, notice. It's this voice here and interestingly this middle voice is exactly the same as the main melody but transposed one octave lower and shifted by one quarter note. Shifted by exactly one quarter note. And still it sounds beautiful. Or maybe that's the reason it sounds beautiful. Let's listen to this again. And the pianist, he tries to emphasize this secondary, the second voice by not playing synchronously, but having a small delay, so to say, to additionally emphasize the music. Now you do onset detection here, <laughs> yeah, and it's completely asynchronous and it's again getting messy. But we as a computer scientist, again, we would love to transcribe this music, to understand it, to separate the voices somehow but this is even hard for a human without any prior knowledge. And this leads us to a final topic. I think I still have 15 minutes or so, or 10 minutes, roughly. Shall I move on or shall I speed up a bit? I don't speed up. <laughs> okay, this leads us to a, another topic, a very important central topic in music processing, audio processing, called source separation. The general idea of source, separate, of source separation is to decompose an audio stream into different sound sources. This is a problem coming from speech processing, often also referred to as cocktail party problem. So you have many people sitting in the same, uh, being in the same room and talking to each other and the human being is able to follow one or the other speaker, concentrate on one or the other speaker, even though they speak simultaneously. So the human can somehow separate different sound sources. And that's what we want to do also using a computer. Now in speech, in the cocktail party uh, effect scenario, the speakers, they are often somehow independent in some statistical sense. Maybe you also have multiple microphones. And this additional information, statistical independence, allows you yeah, to approach this uh, using computational approaches. However, when you think of the sources being instruments playing together, hopefully these sources are not statistically independent. And so they follow the same rhythmic grid. They share many harmonics, notes, 
And, and therefore, that's a, also, also, we often have not multiple uh, microphones. We don't have multi-frack recordings, mainly only a stereo or even only mono, monophonic recording in some archive. Still, we want to do something like source separation for music. Without additional information, this is again hopeless. However, for certain scenarios, it may be feasible, for example, when you have additional information as specified by sheet music. So you have a recording and you have a sheet music representation. The sheet music tells you what to expect, which notes to expect, which instruments to expect. Of course, the sheet music information is not yet synchronized to the audio, but you may exploit that knowledge to use synchronization techniques to link the sheet music to the audio and then use that information to separate the audio recording into different voices, into the different instruments. That's a kind of reverse engineering problem uh, of music production, so to say. So one main idea is uh, you take the sheet music, you take a, a waveform or a spectrogram of an auto recording and using uh, machine learning techniques you try to estimate parameters and from the parameters you try to render something which looks like the original spectrogram. That leads to interesting optimization problems. So interesting mathematics going on there. Another approach is, and that has been used uh, quite extensively some years ago, before uh, deep learning came into the game. Another approach is using matrix factorization techniques, non-negative matrix factorization. You start with a matrix n times m, typically a spectrogram in the music case, and you decompose it into two matrices that have much smaller rank. Now it's getting a bit technical. The, t uh, the columns of the first matrix to be learned are called templates. They often typically encode how something sounds and which pitches are played. So that corresponds, so to say, to the piano keys. And the rows of the second matrix are so-called activation vectors that can be thought as a kind of piano roll representation. And these matrix factorization techniques were used for decomposing music signals into small note-like events. However, with any prior knowledge, the decomposition is often meaningless. You can decompose the spectrogram, but the decomposition is meaningless. So one idea is in the initialization to initialize the templates and the activations in an informed way using sheet music. And then the optimization procedure is only used so that's a coarse decomposition, and then the NMF technique is only used for refining the, deco refining the decomposition and capturing uh, performance-specific aspects. Now, this is, details are not important, but these techniques allow you to decompose an audio recording, for example, of a piano piece, into small spectral, time-spectral snippets that correspond to note events as specified in the sheet music. What is this useful for? First of all, it's fun for an engineer, but it, it's useful for. It can be used for performance analysis, but it can be also used for audio editing applications. Let's assume you have an audio recording and you want to modify the audio recording, make it slower or faster, or maybe removing certain notes or replace them somehow. And for example, you have given this audio recording Chopin prelude in minor, and you want to make it major. So then one idea is, okay, on the sheet music level, that's easy. You just specify, you just change the, the key, and, and you, you specify the notes to be changed. And the idea is that doing the editing on the sheet music level, and then transferring this information to the audio level automatically using these decomposition techniques. That's the result. So 
audio was used, the mono audio, and then modified using engineering techniques. Okay. Here's another example. Similar techniques were used by a PhD to decompose a drum track. This is really annoying here that So that's the arm and break, and the idea is to decompose it into the individual instruments. The hi hat, snare drum, bass drum. It's extremely difficult because they are all percussive these instruments, and they are really share the same. Uh, time positions. And then just to dem to, as a demonstrator, he used the decomposition to resynthesize uh, that by changing the hi-hat. I cannot, the sound quality is so bad that you can hardly listen to it. <laughs> okay, we are coming back to Beethoven. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> this also brings me to the end of the talk. Uh, I have two, three more gimmicks, small gimmicks uh, for entertainment. So what we study in computer science is really some serious stuff. We do machine learning, we do uh, matrix, factorization, ma matrix factorization techniques, we do optimization. That's the same stuff as Computers, uh, as computer graphics people would do, or when you uh, do image processing and so on. Nobody has to justify himself or her herself when he or she says, I am at a computer graphics lab and I do computer graphics. I'm chair of computer graphics. Oh, respectable. Cool. Very good. When you say, I do music processing, people say, huh, music processing, <laughs> that's your hobby, right? No, no, I'm professor for that. <laughs> but technically speaking, we are exactly doing the same stuff. We face the same kind of problems. Uh, but we also have fun. That's the nice thing with music processing. For example, that's something done by a PhD who studied NMF. And his goal was... Starting with a pop song in this case. When I find myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me. Speaking and having some B sounds. <laughs> then an obvious task is to let it be. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so we try to keep the nature of the song somehow rhythmically and pitch-wise, but somehow change uh, the song. This is called audio mosaicing. And the techniques behind are pretty interesting, but I skip them. It's based on matrix factorization and some modifications of that. Actually, the nice thing is this contribution won the best poster presentation award at Izmir. So uh, people admitted that this is at least interesting somehow. Okay. Uh, to finish up, what makes pu music processing so challenging? One main challenge is we just don't know what we are looking for. The notion of similarity is so vague and so application driven that without considering a specific application, it's, it's, it's hopeless. So what we can offer from computer science is to, we can, we can, uh, we can uh, offer a toolkit of certain techniques decomposition techniques, optimization procedures, signal processing and so on. But without a, a concrete application in mind, yeah, uh, we cannot do music processing. To, make, to give you a, a, a simple example of that, I play a piece of music for you, and let's say that's the query of a retrieval task. What should the computer retrieve?
What would you expect as a meaningful match? One match is probably obvious. Bup, 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 bup. Okay, so, I mean, Beethoven. Beethoven's fifth may be an expected match because of the rhythmic nature of the motive. Bup, 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 bup. Another user may have something different in mind. It's happy birthday in minor. <laughs> okay, so it very much depends on the notion of similarity, what the computer should retrieve. Is it rhythmic similarity? Is it melodic similarity, harmonic similarity, temporal similarity, structural similarity? And this is all intermingled. So the first problem we often face in collaborating with musicologists is what are you looking for? Yeah? And in solving this already gives us uh, often half the solution. And this is a final example. Also Bach was of course aware of uh, the notion of similarity. He loved to build in his uh, initials as a motive into his music. So there is the B-A-C-H motif, Bach motif. to replay it. And he built it in, in for example, in this motet. Or was it coming? Yeah? I start from the beginning. Did you hear it? One person. Can you sing along? That's very hard. <laughs> it's at the beginning, right? Here. So Bach was aware that most of his listeners would not recognize this and therefore after the Bach motif in the lyrics you see something like und niemand achtet drauf or nobody cares or notices it. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Let's see if this is working. Um, any, we have, <laughs> any questions? It was good to, it's Friday afternoon after all, so it's good <laughs> to, to finish off with a few funny things. No questions? Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Maynard. Uh, one question. Uh, not innocent, very big question. Um, the analysis by synthesis approach, which is used in many other cases, for instance, when you try to make a good instrumental timbres, you tweak, you discard, you tweak, you discard, and so on. Are you aware of any similar approaches to transcription or so-called computational auditory scene analysis that's based on the principle of trying to synthesize and then compare it with uh, the target and then have some penalty function and uh, a re reiterated uh, resynthesis, so to speak, mm. if, if, if I was able to say it quite clearly. So in, in the ideal case, when you know uh, what are the ingredients into the synthesis process, you can somehow unlock uh, what is actually going on uh, in, in very complicated uh, audio mm. um, scenes. I mean, this very much depends on the task. So, for example, in the audio decomposition scenario, where I had the spectrogram and it was decomposed into smaller matrices and so on, and with the goal to get a node-wise parametrization of the spectrogram, this can be seen as a kind of 
analysis by synthesis. Namely, what you do is you try to rebuild the original spectrum yeah? uh, by, by first estimating some parameters, sparse number, small number of parameters, uh, templates and activations, then you multiply them, you get back some kind of spectrogram, you compare it to the original spectrogram, so uh, multiplying these two matrices is the kind of synthesis step, so to say. You compare it, not on the waveform-based level, but at least in the spectral domain, and then you compute a gradient that, so to say, goes from the given reconstructed spectrogram towards the original one in this direction and updates the parameters, so to say. This is a kind of analysis by synthesis approach in some sense. Uh, for other tasks, uh, uh, you, uh, by design, so to say, you try to find mid-level representations that, so to say, throw away a lot of information you don't need for the analysis task. And the, in this case, like chroma features, for example, in this case, there's no way to get back somehow. So synthesis, uh, analysis by synthesis in these cases, uh, that's a completely different approach. So I would say in source separation, I have seen many kind of analysis by synthesis approaches because you want to decompose something, but as a sum, so to say, you want to be close to the, as close to the original as possible. So I would expect synthesis, analysis by synthesis approaches for tasks that are on the finer level, on this fine-grained level, in the absolute case where you don't have references to compare against. So you, you, you take the original, so to say, as a kind of self-reference to do something, so to say. Uh, I think the same holds, of course, for uh, now, uh, nowadays for machine learning techniques based on autoencoders. They also some, somehow uh, have a bottleneck built in and then expand again. So you have an analysis step and then a synthesis step, and in the loss function you compare the reconstruction to the original, so to say. That's also kind of analysis by synthesis, I guess. Does this somehow come close to your question, or...? <laughs> yeah, thank you, indeed it does. Uh, I, I think that the, the golden standard is what an expert human listener would be able to diagnose, let's say that in Tampa, uh, in, if you are a conductor and you want to f figure out what's wrong with the sound, then you have to do this kind of diagnosis uh, to, to be able to tell, please, uh, a bassoon a little bit uh, louder or the celli uh, put on sardines or uh, whatever. So you, you do this all the time. Uh, it's, it's a kind of practice, but it can only go of course, that far because uh, timbre is so rich, uh, at mm -hmm. least uh, in the orchestral sense. But uh, th the very idea of, of saying that it's a trial of error and human listening is only uh, adequate to a certain point, mm -hmm. and then uh, we don't expect machines to be better than humans. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I, I was thinking about this distinction between the coarse level and fine level, mm -hmm. and the rubato, uh, and, and and somehow uh, rubato was that a fact of the fine level? So I would say that's more on the fine level analysis side. So, for example, when I when I when I do music synchronization, I want to synchronize two versions irrespective of rubato. That's on the course level. When I want to exactly capture the rubato, I would consider this an aspect on a much finer semantic level, so to say. Yeah. Uh, I, I was thinking to what extent fine and coarse is the right distinction, or, or mm. b because it seems like rubato is somehow um, establishing a local uh, time grid. Um, and, and it's a personal, so it's not acoustic objectively in, in the sound, but, but it's the musicians. Uh, it, it's, so, so it's changing between different time spaces in some ways, whereas uh, a fixed measure um, or, or a fixed tempo mm. has more 
uh, if you could make a distinction between egocentric and allocentric, mm. so, so that, that what you call fine-grained would be more egocentric, maybe? Yes. So we, I, I, don't, I don't insist on, on, the, on, the, on, on the terms coarse and fine. Maybe they may not be very adequate or so. Uh, what you said is, is correct. I would agree with that. What I wanted to say is in certain, there are certain tasks where you plant out certain information being considered as irrelevant, which is exactly the kind of information you want to capture for another task. That's what I wanted to say. And sometimes when you communicate with people from different communities, these things are always mixed together. So you do music synchronization, music alignment, or uh, on, on some level, and then people ask, oh, can I use your techniques to, do, uh, to, to, to find out if this is Horowitz or if uh, there's Rubato or whatsoever. And what I wanted to say, that are completely different tasks that require maybe completely different techniques. In this case, this, these two types of information are complementary, so to say, or orthogonal. And uh, it's very hard to, to, so to say, within one framework to understand all aspects at the time. So very often as computer scientists, I intentionally plan out certain details, like Rubato, to approach a specific task on a rather coarse level. That's what I wanted to say. But, but still you could, for example, have fine-grained and coarse-grained Roboto. That's, that's true, on, on different temporal level, maybe yeah. on a structure level and then on a, <laughs> on, on, on a node level or maybe even sub-node level uh, yeah. uh, somehow. Yes, yes, that's true. So then you also have so to say the, the entire temporal, temporal hierarchy you, you, you have to consider. Also, when you talk about structure analysis, what is the structure of a musical piece? You can start with a very coarse structure, whatever, of a sonata form, exposition, rep repetition of that, and de development and recap. Is this the structure that's on a coarse level? Or you can ask, oh no, I want to identify the first theme or group and, and the second one and the transition and, and whatsoever, whatsoever that's on a finer level and then you have the, the, the phrase level and, and the motif level and so on and so forth. And this is all, yeah, somehow there's no clear distinguish, dis, uh, distinction between these levels. So it's also referring to different time scales. And to all the complexity of all of this, I guess, yeah. <laughs> also. Yeah. Okay, I know that some people need to leave quite soon, so I think we, we should try to wrap up here. But thank you very much, Manet, for, yeah. for the lecture. Thank you.